everybody abstracts a different reality. When you come through a room, you abstract the reality you're prepared to abstract. You pick up the signals that interest you. Your brain records them and organizes them. We all have our own reality tunnel, and in our reality tunnel, we uh, pick out some things and ignore other things. And we got 10 billion cells in our brain receiving hundreds and hundreds of millions of signals all the time. We just pick out the ones that fit into the established grooves in our brain, the, the reality tunnel that's been laid down by past experience. We all have our own belief system, and the signals that fit our belief system get in. The signals that don't fit our belief system get ignored, or if they keep coming back, we go to a psychiatrist to get cured and make them go away. Once you get used to thinking in terms of the tuned in and the not tuned in, and all the problems in philosophy about being and non-being and so on seem absolutely nonsensical. We don't know what is or what isn't. All we know is what we tuned in and what we didn't tune in. If you keep track of, who, of what you tuned in, you know, you know, that's what you can talk about meaningfully. What you didn't tune in, you can only make guesses about, or noises, or garbles, or frantic hand gestures. But you, but you can't really know anything about them. You only know what you've tuned in. Now, if you haven't tuned in, it's not necessarily non-existent. It's just not tuned in. So that, that takes care of the whole problem of being and non-being, which Western philosophers have been debating for the last 2,500 years. You don't know anything about being or non-being. You know, all you know is what you tuned in. Bucky Fuller, I seem to be a very, I can't find any constant rough in it, Tom Wilson. It seems to be a process of change all the time. I'm certainly not the guy I was at 40, and I'm certainly not the kid I was in Catholic school at seven or eight. I started out in a little tiny Irish Catholic ghetto in, in Brooklyn or Long Island, I'm not sure which. <laughs> and somehow I have traveled from Maui in the east to Berlin in the west, which is half of the time zones on the planet. And I feel like as, as I've expanded my travel in space, I've expanded my travel through the world of ideas also. I can't believe I started out a, a good Catholic school boy. <laughs> there must have been some good times. Well, I think of my childhood, I just remember the, how frightened I was of the nuns at the school I went to, how sadistic they were. There was so much mystery and ambiguity about everything. Everybody, that's why there's so much in my novels. But adults never gave a straight answer to a child about anything. Everything was lies, hypocrisy, evasions. I knew there was, I knew there was something going on they were hiding from me, and it used to scare me. I wasn't quite sure what it was. I, I might have something to do with the Wolfman or the Frankenstein monster. I didn't know what the hell it was. And I didn't trust them at all. At one, at one point, something around seven or eight, they admitted there was no Santa Claus. And as soon as I recovered from the shock, my next thought is, when are they going to admit there's no God? <laughs> they never did. And I went back to believing in God under the hammering and pounding of the nuns up until I was about 13, I guess. I was a very obedient child. Everybody agrees to that. Everybody I can remember from my childhood. I started rebelling in my teens, and I'm rebelling more, more every year. I remember I don't know how old I was, 14, 15, another unbeliever in myself. 
at Brooklyn Tech, got into an argument with a student who was still a Catholic. He said, if you really believe what you say, you would have the courage to ask God to strike you dead right now to prove that you, that he, that you believe he doesn't exist. And I, I got scared for a minute, then I went ahead and did it, and nothing happened, and I felt totally liberated. Fuck you, you're not there after all. That was a great moment of liberation, which I hardly ever recalled until tonight. Thank God, that was a very important turning point in my life. Here's to the good nuns for telling me what books not to read. Interacting processing. Interacting processing. Interacting processing. Friends, everything the Pope Bob does puts things into a perspective. And not just a unique perspective, but the correct perspective! Because it includes all other perspectives. And so, my friends, I'm very happy and proud to present the Carl Sagan of religion. assembly line workers and folks, the Robert Anton Wilson of humanity. Praise God. Spectacles, testicles, brandy, cigars. You're all popes. You're all absolutely infallible. I have the authority to appoint anybody a Discordian pope because I'm a Discordian pope. The first rule after you become a Discordian Pope is to excommunicate every Discordian Pope you meet. This is based on the basic Discordian principle, we Discordians must stick apart. Discordians don't have dogmas, uh, which are absolute beliefs. We have catmas, which are relative meta-beliefs. And uh, the, the central Discordian catma is, as I said before, uh, any affirmation is true in some sense, false in some sense, meaningless in some sense, true and false in some sense, true and meaningless in some sense, false and meaningless in some sense, and true and false and meaningless in some sense. And if you repeat this 666 times, you will achieve supreme enlightenment in some, <laughs> in some sense. There are approximately 12 million Discordian popes now. Originally, Balaclips the Younger, the founder of Discordianism, had cards printed and uh, he'd just hand them out to everybody he met, making them popes. And then I printed the Pope card in the Illuminatus Trilogy. But then I was living in Ireland and uh, the Pope came to Phoenix Park and announced, the guy who thinks he's the only Pope, uh, he announced that bishops could give indulgences over television which was a new thing in Catholic doctrine. And I got the idea, well, if they can do indulgences on television, I can do pontifications. And so instead of giving out cards, every time I got on radio or television, I made the whole audience popes. Eventually, we'll make every man, woman, and child on this planet a pope. Most religious people take themselves too damn seriously, which is why they act like such damn fools. I'm using the word damn deliberately for the paradoxical effect. Like I'm also a Buddhist, a Taoist, and a Confucian, as well as a Discordian, a subgenius, and a witch. I will officially announce that everybody in this room is now a Discordian Pope, just like me. <laughs> Testicles, testicles, brandy, cigars. You are all absolutely infallible and don't take crap from anybody. Okay. Give me a
Well, I'm, a, I'm an ordained pope of the church of the sub-genius, which means I'm absolutely infallible, so don't dare contradict anything that I say. As for my relationship with Ivan Stein, I deny all the rumors. <laughs> Remember, you're only infallible about your own nervous system. You know what's going on in your own nervous system, what, you, what realities you're creating out of the infinite flux of being. You don't know anything about anybody else's reality unless they tell you about it. You've got to listen very sympathetically to understand them. See, so it's a limited infallibility. Über Quantumphysik, aber ich kann euch nicht garantieren, dass ich das übersetzen kann. Ich glaube, der soll einfach losreden. She wants to know what quantum physics is. What? Quantum physics. What? What? Explain it simply, she asked. Explain quantum physics simply? Uh, <laughs> uh, when I moved from Los Angeles, I moved into what I thought was Santa Cruz. Then we had something stolen from our car, and we called the police. And it turned out we didn't live in Santa Cruz. We lived in a town called Capitola. The post office thought we lived in Santa Cruz but the police thought we lived in Capitola. I started investigating this, and a reporter on the local newspaper told me we didn't live in either Santa Cruz or Capitola. We lived in an unincorporated area called Live Oak. Now, quantum mechanics is just like that, except that in the case of Santa Cruz, Capitola, and Live Oak, we don't get too confused because we remember we invented the lines on the map. But quantum physics seems confusing because a lot of people think we didn't invent the lines. So it seems hard to understand how a particle can be in three places at the same time without being anywhere at all. But when you remember that we invented all the boundaries, borders, and lines just like the Berlin Wall, then quantum mechanics is no more mysterious than the fact that I live in three places at the same time. No Chinese raised on I Ching has ever found quantum mechanics puzzling. It's only puzzling to people raised on Aristotelian logic where things are either A or not A. In the aging, things are A and not A at the same time. With quantum mechanics, you can prove that light is made out of particles experimentally. You can build up a whole mathematical theory of light traveling in little particles called photons, and you can do experiments, and the experiments will give you a pattern showing that light is traveling like particles. We've also got a whole mathematical theory built up showing that light travels as waves. And we've got experiments that will show you that light travels as waves. As one uh, physicist in the 1920s said, it looks as if the damn light is waiting to see how we're going to do the experiment and then deciding which way it's going to travel. <laughs> Schrodinger said, I wish I never got mixed up with this verdompte quantum springer I, this goddamn quantum jumping. The modified Copenhagen view is light is neither waves nor particles until we look, and then it, then it adjusts itself depending on what we're looking at it with. An electron is not anywhere until we look. And when we look, the electron decides to be somewhere as long as we're looking. As soon as we stop looking, the electron is everywhere again. Every model we make uh, tells us how our mind works it, uh, as much as it tells us about the universe. These are, these are just uh, human uh, symbolic games. Mm -hmm. The universe itself uh, is bigger than any of our models. According to Zen Buddhism and most forms of Buddhism and quantum mechanics, any description of the universe which leaves you out is inaccurate because any description of the universe is a description of the instrument that you use to take your reading of the universe. And if the only instrument you use is your own nervous system, you've got to include your own nervous system in your description of the universe. So, ergo, any model we make does not describe the universe. It describes what our brains are capable of saying at this time. Long before quantum mechanics, the, the, the German philosopher Husserl said that all perception is gamble. Every type of bigotry, every type of racism, sexism, prejudice, every dogmatic ideology that, that allows people to kill other people with a clear conscience, every stupid cult, every superstition-ridden religion, every kind of ignorance in the world, 
uh, all results from not realizing that our perceptions are gambles. We believe what we see, and then we believe our interpretation of it. We don't even know we're making an interpretation most of the time. We think this is reality. In philosophy, that's called naive realism. What I perceive is reality. And philosophers have, have refuted naive realism every century for the last 2,500 years, starting with Buddha and Plato. And yet most people still act on the basis of naive realism. Now the argument is, well, maybe my perceptions are inaccurate, but somewhere there is accuracy. The scientists have it with their instruments. That's how we can find out what's really real. But relativity and quantum mechanics have demonstrated clearly that what you find out with instruments is true relative only to the instrument you're using and where that instrument is located in space-time. So there is no vantage point from which real reality can be seen. We're all looking from the point of view of our own reality tunnels. And uh, when we begin to realize that we're all looking from the point of view of our own reality tunnels, we find it is much easier to understand where other people are coming from, or the ones who don't have the same reality tunnel as us do not seem ignorant or deliberately perverse or lying or hypnotized by some mad ideology. They just have a different reality tunnel and every reality tunnel might tell us something interesting about our world if we're willing to listen. The idea every perception is a gamble seems to me so obviously true that I continually am astonished that I, I can forget it so many times in the course of 24 hours. But to the extent that I remember it, I can't stay, I can't stay angry at anybody, so it's a thing worth be keeping in mind. <laughs> birthday seems like a dinosaur. I seem more like a dinosaur myself. <laughs> well, you know, we're all rapidly turning into dinosaurs. <laughs> Sometimes I feel as old as the Mojave Desert. <laughs> Sometimes I look in the mirror and I think I look like a dead mule. <laughs> That's, only... <laughs> That's only when I first get up in the morning. <laughs> I heard this morning for about an hour after I got up. That's about all. You just took a little bit of muffin in the morning? And... I took a little bit of muffin. It hasn't bothered me since. I haven't taken any more muffin. Oh, As you may have guessed, I have post-polio sequelae, which is the symptoms that follow polio, sometimes 20 years later, sometimes 40 years later. In my case, it took 60 years before they caught up with me. One of them is a lot of leg problems, which is why I'm in a wheelchair. Another one is that I feel 20 degrees colder than the average person, whatever the temperature is. I had polio at the age of four. I was cured by the Sister Kenny method at a time when the American Medical Association was announcing her as a quack and a charlatan and a witch doctor. <laughs> It was about, no, oh, about six years after I was cured by the Sister Kenny method that the AMA finally admitted the method worked. Now nobody needs it anymore because nobody gets polio anymore. They, they got the vaccine for it. But uh, I, I knew all my life I had post-polio syndrome, but, but it was always mild. I had uh, what they call myoclonism, which is spasms in the feet which can be a damn nuisance when you're trying to sleep at night and the feet start jerking and waking you up. And then I had pains in the legs when I had to stand on long lines. I got to hate airports. I can walk a few steps. As a matter of fact, I can walk more than a few steps, but I'm not going to try it because if I fall down, everybody would be embarrassed and feel sorry for me. But you see, I can walk a few steps which I couldn't do two years ago when the thing was at its worst. Post-polio syndrome turned really flared up. That was, that will be two years ago next month. And boy, there was a week there when I could hardly move. Everything hurt. 
Going to the bathroom was like going to the South Pole with Admiral Byrd. I mean, getting from, oh God. I couldn't move anything without terrible pains. Maybe some of the dead muscles are coming back to life and the, the cell bodies are putting forth axons and then drown. That's what's supposed to be happening anyway. Somehow, dealing with the post-polio has given me a greater self-esteem, as they say nowadays. Mm. I feel, hell, I'm dealing with this very well. I, I feel pretty good for myself. And I still have time to think about other people, which is very important. Mm -hmm. The worst thing about illness is it makes you self-centered. I don't think that's happened, really. So, I, I think you can get a lot out of an illness. Processing interactions, tuning in interactive processes. Processing interacting is all I ever tune in. I cannot tune in anything but interacting processing. The, the biggest thing I got from Bob is that uh, all of our reality constructs are models. You know, all of them are approximations, are metaphors, are allegories for what's going on. And that we live in a world where we are all negotiating. Um, our, we're negotiating um, for on behalf of our stories. All thought is metaphor. Uh, the map is not the territory. Every verbal map we make is a metaphor, but existence is not words, it's not mathematical equations. The universe is much bigger and more complicated than any little map we can make of it. The map is not the territory. The words that describe the map are not the territory. They're even further from the territory. So not only does the map not show all the territory, but the map is a generalization which doesn't fit any particular territory. What I perceive is not what's out there, it's just what I perceive. Blake said uh, in his attack on the moon, the scientist says uh, the sun is a molten rock in the sky. Can you not see that? Blake says, I cannot see that. I see a choir of angels singing glory, glory, glory to the Lord God omnipotent. And that's Blake's reality. Uh, both realities are equally right, depending on uh, where you're at. If you want to do a chemical analysis of the sun, you use the scientific reality. It's not a rock anymore, it's a nuclear furnace. But you use the latest scientific reality. But subjectively, I understand how Blake felt when he saw the sun as a bunch of angels singing glory, glory, glory to the Lord God. I, I've seen trees doing that. Uh, that's a very valuable reality tunnel to be in. One doesn't contradict the other. You know, we each create a story, a narrative, a picture, an allegory, a model for what's going on here, and then we fight, sometimes to the death, to make others, if not believe in that model, we fight to, to be able to keep believing it in ourselves. So we, we try to erase con contradictory evidence to that model. I agree with the Buddha, there is no meaning in life. The meaning is in sentences. Meaning is in symbols that symbolize life. Life itself does not have a meaning because that's what meaning refers to. Meaning refers to life. To look for meaning in life is like looking for trees on a map. You can find squiggles that represent trees. When you find the trees there, the squiggles only represent the trees. Or the rivers. You can't wash in a river on a map. You gotta find a real river in the non-map world. Is that clear? I'm trying to make a difference between the words and the metaphors and the existential experiences. But it, it also becomes where I, uh, I end up kind of parting ways philosophically with him, too. You know, I get the feeling that, that Bob is not just a-spiritual, but anti-spiritual. You know, he, he, he doesn't believe in God or spirit or... Uh, a special super reality connecting us all. 
because it's not there, because it's not evident, because it's not apparent. And I feel in a way like Bob's worldview, having, having passed through the, the chapel perilous uh, of, of, of wonder, uh, that his view now is that, well, there's nothing. You know, this is it, period. As far as I'm concerned, the idea that there's nothing is just another what if. You know, it's, it's the skeptic in, in Cosmic Trigger. It's the skeptic's worldview, but it's just a worldview. And I don't think it's any intrinsically safer. I have heard it said in a critical way that Robert Anton Wilson doesn't believe in anything. And if that is true, then I applaud him for that because that is the hallmark of a truly free man. As long as you subscribe to a dogma, any dogma, no matter how benign, you will never be free. And if Bob doesn't believe in anything, that is not to say that he doesn't care about things. I think he cares about things passionately. It's just that he hasn't allowed the central focus of his intellect and his emotions to be usurped by some ideology. But maybe, maybe refusing to believe in belief is an ideology, but if, if so, it's a very flexible one. Non-simultaneously apprehended interacting processing. I see no nouns, I only see verbs. Not only do I seem to be a verb like Bucky Fuller with the whole universe, scenario universe seems to be a verb. Interacting, processing. He does not seem to be stricken by polio. You know, it seems to be that that's a happenstance, something that's occurring with the body but it, it hasn't dampened his, his really remarkable spirit. You know. um, his body, you know, his body's failing. Post-polio is a dramatic and, um, and you know, brutal opponent at times. But I, I believe that he is always looking for a new discovery. And in that, whether it's trying to take fewer steps um, because his, his polio won't allow him to walk and yet you know how he greets that is still with that same wonder it's, it's an experiment one of the greatest relief I get from pain is from marijuana brownies made by uh, women's collective uh, people with muscular dystrophy, post-polio syndrome, AIDS, can cancer, and a few other problems that are very clearly and obviously helped by marijuana brownies. And when this federal government announces that they've canceled the Tenth Amendment and the states have no right to legalize anything that the federal government is against, I, I am naturally furious. They're threatening me with a life of steady pain until I die. That's what they're threatening me with. Of course I'm pissed off at them. And it's not just for my own sake, but it's for the sake of all the AIDS patients, all the cancer patients, all the other people who are, well, who, for whom life is bearable because they can get uh, some marijuana in one form or another. It is, it is one of the best painkillers known, and it's not addictive, and it, and it has an extra added benefit, the high, which is what everybody, which is what the, the SOG is afraid of. They don't want anybody to get high because people who are high get happy and people who get happy get ambitious and uppity and rambunctious. And They want everybody to be depressed. But the, the high is part of the cure. Every, I think every goddamn disease in the world is improved by feeling happy and good. And any, any, any compound that not only relieves pain but makes you feel happy and cheerful and think of funny things is helping your cure. And the remnants of the cannabis muffin that I had around 6 o'clock, God's own medicine. Nothing is bothering me. 
Around six o'clock, the leg was starting to bother me again. Nothing is bothering me. Most of today I spent on the couch. Oh, yeah? Listening to the Atmospheres channel, that's new age music. I don't know why, sometimes I like to listen to light classical. But today I was in the mood for Atmospheres. I was doing visualizations. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I was trying to, as the music, following the rhythm of the music, I had lights flowing up through my body, trying to cure the pain in the leg. Between that and the muffins, I finally got rid of the pain, but it took a long time. <laughs> Sometimes it's quicker than others. I think pain is a mistake. If I had been around the creation, I would have had a lot of helpful suggestions, as Frankin said. And I would have said, we don't need pain. Just put a little uh, neon light on there. I had the lights up and said, see a doctor. And they said, hey, your, your sign is on, go see a doctor. You don't need pain to tell you. I, I know, seriously, what I'm getting at is I think pain can be abolished. I don't see any reason why all forms of pain can't be abolished with the proper drugs. And I think the government's attempt to control drug research out of fear that two people may feel too good is the last dying gasp of the dinosaur age. I think we are governed by Tyrannosaurus Rex and uh, Velociraptors and, and types like that. I, I really think the abolition of pain is the noblest goal we can aim for. Also clean water for everybody and enough food. I think these are quite attainable goals. If society was saying these would be our goals. Spread clean water, adequate food, and the absence of pain all over the planet. Who, who, would, who would want to become a terrorist? What would they be, what would they be angry about? Why would they be mad enough about to start throwing bombs at somebody else? What about the Iron Triangle? It's rather inconspicuous and I just uh, want to point out how often the eye and the triangle is there. It's, it pops up frequently, and this, of course, is the uh, symbol of the Illuminati, the alleged secret society that controls the whole world, according to a lot of occult uh, <laughs> theories. And it's, you'll find it on the back of your Thank dollar you. bill, too. It's great to see all your faces out there, ladies, gentlemen, and narcs. <laughs> Everybody look around and see if you can spot the narcs. <laughs> they're, they're the ones who look like hippies. Uh, <laughs> For a person who's an expert in conspiracies, you're probably the least paranoid person I've ever met. You, uh, you have the, all the data, but none of the fear that uh, uh, most everybody else who's involved in conspiracy theories. Well, my belief is I don't believe in one big conspiracy that runs everything. I prefer to think there's, a, at minimum, at any given time, there's about 24 conspiracies afoot. And as far as I have been able to discover in all my years of being involved in, uh, more or less unwillingly in this field, <laughs> I cannot find any proof of any conspiracy that really existed, was really brought into court and convicted that lasted more than 10 years before everybody double-crossed everybody else and the conspiracy fell apart. When you define the power elite as somebody else, I regard that as a loser script. I define the power elite as myself and my friends, and that's a winner script. And uh, the way to accomplish things is with a winner script. I, I define myself as a winner, I define my program winnable, and uh, I count on the stupidity of whoever seems to be in power to undo them eventually, because as I said, every conspiracy has a natural lifespan, every conspiracy collapses by double crosses from within or by superior cleverness by rival conspiracies and uh, stupidity has a definite evolutionary function I am all for abolishing stupidity but before it goes uh, while there's still a lot of it around we should pay tribute to it
the strongest conspiracy on the planet is the conspiracy of the stupid. Yeah. To prevent schools from educating their children, because they want their children to be as dumb as they are, to prevent television from putting anything intelligent <laughs> on as much as possible. What, what is it about the human psyche that seems to be drawn towards these conspiracy theories? Is it some uh, love of the unknown or some idea that uh, there may be forces out there that are controlling our destiny? Or, uh, well, I think there are three factors. A, nobody likes to take the blame for their own problems, so they look for somebody else to blame. <laughs> and if you can find a big enough group, yeah, you've, mm -hmm. you've explained everything in your life that doesn't work. That's it's the not parental your, conspiracy theory. Yeah, it's right? not your fault. It's the fault. Yeah, if it's not your fault, you're your fault or your parents. It's the Jesuits, the Freemasons, <laughs> the Jews, the, uh, for the Bilderbergers. The Council on Foreign Relations of the Pay. You, know, you got a lot of white choice to pick who to blame. Rich right? white man. Yeah. yeah, as long as you don't have to blame yourself. That's one motive. And another motive is that uh, we are living in very weird times. The world is changing faster and faster, which I think is due to the uh, acceleration of information flow in the modern world. Information is increasing and the transmission of information is going faster and faster due to internet and the whole computer revolution which means that most people are living in a world they can't understand and when people can't understand something they tend to go for sinister explanations of it somebody is manipulating things in a way i don't like mm -hmm. that's the way people feel when things change too fast and they can't understand it and the third reason is uh, of course that there are lots of conspiracies around <laughs> None simultaneously apprehended. Apprehended none simultaneously interacting processes. Interacting processes apprehended none simultaneously. Let, let me switch gears with you a little bit. I'd like to talk about your interest in occultism. You've been a, a student, quite a student, I think, of the writings and teachings of Aleister Crowley who was a, a writer about occult magical rituals. And I believe you've participated in a variety of magical rituals. What's that about? Well, uh, uh, well, the, the background is I, I believe that what we perceive is based on our, the culture of our parents and our teachers and the people around us and on the language we speak and I'm interested in ways of changing perception and I have a lot of exercises I've tried for changing my ways of perceiving the world and myself. Crowley's system of magic is a system of fucking with your brain until the impossible becomes possible and you get out of your imprinted reality tunnel into an infinity of mirrors where anything is possible. I think the major, major thing you can learn from Crowley is how to change your focus and look through different grids, different, different reality tunnels, as Leary would say. Bruno uh, represents the point in our culture where science and mysticism were alive. They were both attempts to find out what the hell is going on in this universe uh, by experimental method and by trust in the ability of the individual to figure out what the hell is going on just through the method of experiment. And anyway, that's the, ba the background is experiments on altering consciousness and perceived reality tunnels. In Bruno's day, it was uh, the three terms were divided up differently. You had science and mysticism on one side and religion on the other side. Science and mysticism were allied in their struggle against religion. Science and mysticism were both based on experience and they were both based on respect for the individual. The idea of science and mysticism was go out and discover for yourself, find out what works, find out how the universe is actually structured and how you relate to the structure of the universe. And so there were basically two uh, areas of scientific exploration, the external and the internal, but they were both pursued by the same method, the experimental method. Originally I was just trying to find out uh, what the hell is a mystical experience. But then I very soon got the idea of re-imprinting, and then I got the idea of using Crowley's magic along with the re-imprinting. Uh, ritual is to the internal sciences what experiment is to the external sciences. Mysticism understood in that way is basically, basically a branch of science. It's a branch of uh, neuroscience, uh, what Timothy Leary calls neurologic. Uh, 
as distinguished from uh, orthodox neurology, which involves dissecting uh, animals or dissecting corpses or something. Neurologic is studying the nervous system directly by varying the parameters on which your nervous system functions. There are different levels of reality, obviously, and the psychedelic level is one of the most fascinating ones, one of the most erotic, one of the most mystical, and above all, one of the funniest. I recommend it highly to, <laughs> to everybody over 40. I'm not going to repeat Leary's mistake. I don't, I don't recommend it to anybody under 40. Over 40, you're on your own. You're responsible for yourself. Don't blame me for it. <laughs> Are You Serious comes from uh, directly from Robert Anton Wilson, actually, the uh, book Cosmic Trigger, in which he goes into the serious mysteries. It's also, I mean, one of the great books uh, for uh, just uh, raising your level of clarity and intelligence and uh, psychedelic humor and uh, everything you could possibly want from a book. Cosmic Trigger was the uh, mother lad. Those of you who have read my book, Cosmic Trigger, know... Ah, a lot of you. Oh, that's a, hey, that's very flattering. You all know what happened on July 23rd, 1973. That was the day I achieved contact with an extraterrestrial from Sirius or started hallucinating like mad, depending on which way you want to look at it. I have varied between both theories over the years. But I just found out recently, since I'm a student of synchronicity, this one really struck me. July 23rd, 1973 was also the birthday of Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> Around 1973, I became convinced for a while that I was receiving messages from outer space. But then a psychic reader told me I was actually channeling an ancient Chinese philosopher and another psychic reader told me I was channeling a medieval Irish bard. And at that time, I started reading neurology, and I decided it was just my right brain talking to my left brain. And then I went to Ireland, and I found out it was actually a six-foot-tall white rabbit. They call it the puka, and the Irish know all about it. So it depends on who I'm talking to, which of these metaphors I use to explain uh, where these uh, weird... Uh, patterns come from that jump out of the books and take hold of the readers and change their lives. It's not me, it's a six foot tall white rabbit from County Kerry. Well, looking back, I accept that metaphor is pretty accurate. All writers are channelers in some sense. Faulkner talked about the demon that dictated his books to him. Norman Mailer talks about the navigator in the unconscious. William Blake said the prophets Ezekiel and Isaiah dictated his poetic, uh, prophetic books to him. Uh, uh, most uh, artists traditionally have talked about the muse. And uh, for people in County Kerry, it's a six foot tall white rabbit. For me, it was an extraterrestrial from Sirius. It's, uh, there are different metaphors for the experience. Philip K. Dick and I had a series of rather similar experiences, and out of his experiences he constructed to Alice, which looks like a science fiction story most of the way, and then abruptly at the end you suddenly find out maybe it's not a science fiction story, maybe it's an account of Philip K. Dick going crazy, or maybe it's an account of Philip K. Dick being contacted by extraterrestrials. Well, the cosmic trigger has pretty much the same structure. So that Robert Anton Wilson being contacted by extraterrestrials. No, it's Robert Anton Wilson going crazy. No, it's just Robert Anton Wilson experimenting with alternative realities and coming out of Chapel Perilous at the end without believing in any of them. The structures are very similar because they were based on very similar experiences. I woke up. After doing a ritual to the Holy Guardian Angel, I woke up with this vivid memory of this guy with a long white beard, long, long white beard, like Mr. Natural. As an old white man, looking rather like Jehovah in the, in the illustrated Bible, <laughs> writing on a blackboard things about time that I was supposed to memorize. Serious is very important to you. And I went 
went to the town library and looked up Sirius and all the astronomy books. And I found out July 23rd is the day when Sirius seems to rise behind the sun from a scene from Egypt in the beginning of what they call the dog days. Why did I have that dream on a day connected with Sirius? What had I invoked? It was my way of experiencing the world. Completely. And there were flashes of psychic ability, which I, to a degree, I never had before or since. Well, let's say I believed it passionately for a couple of months. Then I began to have doubts, and then suddenly I had this flash of insight about two and a half years later. My God, this is the same sort of thing that's been called by different names in different traditions. Because it's been going on all over the world for centuries. And every shaman has an ally, and I was an apprentice shaman. I had to find an ally, and I found one. Boy, did I find one. Uh, Chapel Perilous is uh, a stage in the magical quest uh, in which uh, Uh, your maps turn out to be totally inadequate for the territory and you are completely lost. And at that point, uh, you uh, get an ally who helps you find your way back to something you can understand. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you've got the, for the rest of your life, you got this question, uh, was that ally a supernatural helper, or was it just part of my own mind trying to save me from going totally bonkers with this stuff? And uh, the people I know who've had the, that kind of experience, uh, very few of them have ever come to an absolutely certain conclusion about that. <laughs> the puka plays the same role as the holy guardian angel in Kabbalistic magic or the extraterrestrial and the Whitley Strieber type experience, or the ghosts of dead relatives speaking through a seance in 19th century spiritualism, or Ramtha speaking through Jay-Z Knight. These are all different metaphors for basically the same experience. I, I spent a year and a half at least, half believing that I was in telepathic communication with a higher intelligence from the serious double star system. As a matter of fact, I still believe that every Thursday for two hours in the afternoon. No, not really. I, I'm completely cured of that one. I'm still an optimist, though. In the age of George Bush, that's roughly equivalent to thinking you're talking to intelligent dogs. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there was no confusion in 1973 about giant rabbits and extraterrestrials. <laughs> that was only temporary. <laughs> you might say it hasn't ended yet. I'm still trying to figure out what the hell is going on. I like the, I like the giant rabbit from County Kerry because there's no chance anybody will take that literally. Anything else that I say they might take literally. How about yourself? Uh, so that's another reason I like the giant rabbit from County Kerry. I'm not gonna take him literally. Well, not too literally. Sorry about that, Harry. My cosmic schmuck principle <laughs> holds that if you occasionally notice that you've been thinking or acting like a cosmic schmuck, you will become less of a cosmic schmuck. And the more often you notice that you're thinking and acting like a cosmic schmuck, the less of a cosmic schmuck you become. On the other hand, if you never, never, never suspect you might be thinking or acting like a cosmic schmuck, you will remain a cosmic schmuck for the rest of your life. E prime is English without the use of any form of is or being. We're trapped in linguistic const constructs. All that is is metaphor. I believe somebody said that before me. I've decided we can't get beyond words. What we got to do is get more cynical about our words. You'll find that by dispensing with is and trying to reformulate without is, 
you just naturally fall into the kind of expression which is considered acceptable in modern science. Uh, also, it's the type of consciousness that uh, Zen Buddhism tries to induce. Using E prime, you will understand modern science and Zen Buddhism both a lot better than you've ever understood them before. Martin Gardner has written a long essay proving that to think like this will destroy your mind. I, I, think, it, I think it adds tremendously to clarity. I am removing the is from my writing more and more. Removing it from your speech is even harder. Instead of thinking the grass is green, to think the grass appears green to me. And this saves me a lot of time, by the way. I don't get embroiled in arguments like Beethoven is better than Mozart or rock is better than soul. I define such things as meaningless. And so people get into arguments like that. I just say, well, Beethoven seems better to me than Mozart most of the time. But I don't say Beethoven is better than Mozart. I return to E prime in my thinking whenever I find myself getting angry at somebody or, or feeling depressed or hopeless or having negative emotional states in general. Once you put them in, and once you take out all the uses out of all your negative statements, you find out they're all relative to how you feel at the moment. People would by and large act a hell of a lot more sanely, and especially if they, you know, when they got rid of is, they dropped, they put maybe in more sentences. I think if everybody used maybe more often, the, the increase in general sanity would be absolutely, it would, it would seem absolutely astonishing and completely flabbergasted everybody. What the hell is this? We suddenly got a planet full of sane people. When did that start to happen? I didn't even notice it. You just listen to the craziest people on the news and on television or the craziest columnist in the newspapers you know they never say maybe they're always quite sure and they always know is and they never say seems they always say is I'm continually astonished that all the people in the world who think they have the answer to everything none of them ever suspect they might be cosmic schmucks and have the wrong answer and I find that the only explanation that makes sense to me is in Korzybski's science and sanity these people don't know how to use language properly. They're using language in an overly dogmatic way, which sets their brain into overly dogmatic modes. So they think dogmatically, they perceive dogmatically, they even smell dogmatically, they hear dogmatically. They're locked in a trap of fixed, fixed neurosemantic circuits in their brains. Whereas knowing I'm a cosmic schmuck, I always think of at least five alternatives. When people start arguing about words, and they're mostly arguing about whether the words that they apply to the objects they have created out of the infinity of, uh, of possible objects that could be put together. They picked up a few of them, then they put words on them, then they quarrel about the words. And if, uh, if these people get to the stage where they're willing to kill one another over the words, they should be put in a nice, quiet home in the country with kindly doctors and beautiful nurses and good sedatives. But generally, they end up in government mansions and start bombing one another. Or they lead religious crusades for the true faith and kill one another with swords or some such thing. have a consistent message in his work. Does he have a consistent message? Maybe. Maybe that's the message. Nothing is truly consistent. There are no absolute yeses or absolute noes. There are probabilities and strong maybes and weak maybes. But uh, maybe if we all said maybe more often, the world might be a saner place. Uh, Pope Bob is certainly uh, been able to um, weave a certain magical spell using nothing but logic. And what is logic, you ask? Why, nothing but magic. As Ezra Pound writes in one of the latter cantos, the water bugs mitten show on the bright rock below him. Duh, interaction. You don't have the water bugs mittens on the bright rock without the water bug, the rock and the sun to cast a shadow. 
And of course you need a planet that will produce a water bug and a rock, and you need human eyes to see it all. That's Tao Da, interacting, processing. One of the introductory koans in Zen Buddhism, who is the great magician who makes the grass green? And you need a human brain, dogs see grass differently. After all, you need a human brain and you need the grass hitched together to make the yoga, which we call the greenness of the grass. Now, everybody thinks it's very hard to be a mystic. You've got to go through a hell of a lot of effort to realize your union with everything. But actually, you're experiencing your union with everything all the time. Otherwise, you wouldn't be experiencing anything. <laughs> you make the grass green. You make your highs and you make your lows. But you don't do it alone. You're making it out of your union with the universe. And so everything is a coincidence of contraries. It's a coincidence of you being there and the universe being there. And everything is one at the same time because there's no green without the grass and there's no green without you. So the greenness is a transaction that ties you and the grass together. There's an infinite expanse of signals flooding into our nervous system and being processed by a higher neural centers in the brain. We're all organizing and orchestrating it according to our own particular life history, our genetic background, our early imprints, our conditioning, our learning, and any re-imprinting techniques we may have learned since then. So we're all living in different worlds. It's astonishing that we can communicate at all. But you are the co-creator Experiences generated by us. We're not generating it out of nothing, but we are generating it. We are creating the reality tunnel we're experiencing from moment to moment. So there's a total unity between you and the universe, whether you're aware of it or not. The universe you live in is your creation. <laughs> but you're not doing it consciously. When you have seen the one who makes the grass green, it's like meeting your own father in a crowd. You'll have no doubt whatsoever. Nasruddin went galloping through Baghdad one day on his donkey. He went up every street and into every alley and across every plaza. He was galloping all over this, every place he could go, and an, an unending race and hunt and search. Everybody got curious, everybody came out of their houses and they were all yelling, Nasruddin, Nasruddin, what are you looking for? And he yelled back, I lost my donkey and I'm looking for it. Uh, the donkey represents the, what everybody is looking for, which is a mystical school. It's the answer to all the riddles of the universe. And you hunt for it east, west, north, south, up, down, every way you can imagine. All the time it's carrying you around. It's the human nervous system which takes out of the infinity of the universe the little reality tunnel that you, that you consider reality, which is your creation and which you think is the whole of the universe. Unless you've been through a Sufi school or studied general semantics or did a lot of Zen meditation or dropped LSD once or twice, then you realize the universe is much bigger and more complicated than any little map we can make of it. The map is not the territory. The words that describe the map are not the territory, even further from the territory. <laughs> what I've been doing is trying to put the donkey on your back in such a way you'll never forget the master, the great magician who makes the grass green the one who creates the whole universe you live in. Interacting, processing, Tao, Da. That's all I tune in, interacting, processing. No nouns anywhere. Never met a noun yet. I, I, I often thought of myself as, in terms of that old Chinese proverb, the wise are the wise become Confucian in good times, Buddhist in bad times, and Taoist in old age. I always had a lot more sympathy for that, those three religions, in quotes, and the trinity of the Occidental ones, like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all of which seem to me fanatical, intolerant, violence prone. This old Judeo-Christian monotheistic trip has been the worst nightmare this planet has ever endured. They, they just never stop killing one another. Meanwhile, the 
Confucians, the Taoists, and the Buddhists, each in their own way, have try, tried to create a peaceful and amicable society. And what I like in Buddhism is the basic idea of forgiveness, because nobody realizes how wonderful it is until they begin to develop some talent at actually doing it. Because the more you forgive, the less burdens you got to carry around with you. When you reach the point where you can forgive everybody, you're almost entirely free of burdens. What's important to me at this point in my life? Making really sure that I have forgiven all anybody who's ever hurt me or seemed to be an enemy. But making sure I'm, I have nothing but forgiveness for everything. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I think it's a very liberating experience to realize how little you really know and how much of the time you're just guessing. One thing that makes forgiveness easier, and believe me, life without forgiveness ain't worth living. Also, it keeps you from acting like too much of a damn fool if you're not really sure. People who are really sure all act like damn fools at least half of the time. Maybe more than that. I haven't, I haven't really studied the matter that closely. I have to think some more about that. How often does being sure about everything make you act like a damn fool? Probably about 90% of the time, and that's, what, and that's what's wrong with the planet. I am not going to commit a federal crime. You want to see a federal crime committed? Yes. This is a pain pill provided by the Women's Alliance for Medical Marijuana. Keeps my legs from hurting me too much. Tell me what, why you're here today and what you hope to achieve. Well, in the first place, I hope to get to my medicine so my leg won't go on hurting the way it's been since I got off my side. That is the most important immediate existential fact. I am in pain. I want medicine. The second reason I'm here is I happen to believe in states' rights. I believe in the Tenth Amendment, which most people have never heard of. You look in the back of your dictionary, you find a document called the U.S. Constitution. It has nothing to do with the way this government is operating under George Bush, which is the way it's supposed to operate. And the Tenth Amendment it says all power is not delegated to the federal government are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Now the state of California and the people of California are behind me. The federal government has no right to, inter no right to condemn me to a life of constant pain, which is what they're trying to do. I don't know what kind of sadistic son of a bitch George Bush is, why he wants to leave people in pain like this, but I, I don't approve of it, I don't like it, and I'm ready, to, I'm ready to fight for my right to be free of pain. If you're going to be in pain most of the day, you're not going to enjoy your life much. And George Bush insists that God has appointed him to, to ensure that I spend the rest of my life in pain without any relief. And I say, fuck you, George Bush, you should have these pains in your goddamn life. I know it doesn't sound very, I'm a Buddhist most of the time, but today I'm too angry to be a Buddhist. I'll get back to being a Buddhist tomorrow. Anything else you want to add? Any final thoughts today? Yeah, I'm sorry for my bitterness against George Bush. He is equally empty, equally blessed, and equally a coming Buddha. The trouble is the asshole doesn't know it. Okay. I'd like to introduce Robert Anton Wilson, um, 72, who has post-polio syndrome. I can speak. I am indeed Robert Anton Wilson, and I do indeed have post-polio syndrome, but I am not 72, I am only 70. <laughs> and I will go get my medicine after saying I like that sign. I will pick up my medicine after saying I like it. Of all the signs out there, the one I like best is the one telling the government to read the Tenth Amendment.
The Tenth Amendment says that all powers not delegated to the gov federal government are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Nowhere does it say that a goddamn czar will be in charge of my medical care and interfere between me and my doctor. Anybody in Philadelphia in the 18th century suggested putting something like that in the Constitution would have been considered a raving lunatic. This Constitution was not created to establish a czarist tyranny, it was established to create a free society. I, I think my writing comes out of anger and optimism. Anger at the stupid, maniacal, or corrupt crowd that's running the world at present, and optimistic about the opportunities that are so real. This, as I say, is the result of uh, my outrage, my horror, my grief, and my anger at the, the way the world has been going lately, and my continued optimism that maybe enough people can wake up on time to change the direction we're going in. So I got both optimism and anger, which I think is a good mixture. It keeps me busy anyway. I have a lot of hope. I, I may be the last optimist left on the planet for all I know. But at the same time, I see really terrible problems and injustices and violence all over the place. I just think we're, we're, we're heading for a point at which that will no longer be viable. Somehow we're going to have to find a more decent form of society if we're going to survive at all. <clears throat> you can only write about what has impinged upon your nervous system strongly enough to leave a powerful imprint. And I, when I was 12 years old, they opened the Nazi annihilation camps. I think that's a very vulnerable age for imprints. I grew up feeling I, live, I was living in a race of monsters. And I've lived all through the Cold War, the Vietnam War and uh, a lot of other tragedies, personal and otherwise, and uh, I, can't, I can't write fiction without violence in it because violence is so much part of the world I've lived in. It's obvious they're getting, they're getting closer and closer to the edge where they can cure anything. Meanwhile, the world is moving closer and closer to the edge where they can kill us all. <laughs> it's very interesting. Science is going in one direction and the politics is going in the other. I'm still an optimist. I think, I, I think eventually people give up doing stupid things. It's like walking into a wall over and over. Eventually you start looking for the door and you do something intelligent. <laughs> Every human race has to do something intelligent in the next 10 or 20 years and it just can't go on screwing up everything. We're living among infinite possibilities and the prevalent philosophies of postmodernist pessimism that come out of the universities are really a major tragedy. The opportunities for progress and change of a positive nature are absolutely tremendous. Anybody who tells you that we're running out of resources, we're in a terrible mess, they're idiots. We can't run out of resources. Resources exist when the human mind sees how to use something. To say we're running out of resources is like saying we're running out of brain cells. I don't know why so many people spend so much time in a pessimistic reality tunnel. It's a miserable place to live. Mm -hmm. But some people feel if they leave it, they feel guilty. You're supposed, if you're not in a pessimistic tunnel, you're not responsible. Uh, but once I get out of it, I never wanted to go back into it again. As far as I know, I'm the only survivor of the 60s who was just as angry and just as optimistic as I was then. Besides, until I die, I might as well be optimistic. Every day you've got choices to make, and the more optimistic you feel, the more likely you are to make uh, charitable and kindly choices rather than angry and bitter ones. If you want to be the most depressed person in the world, get up every morning and remind yourself George Bush is still in the White House. <laughs> and then listen to CNN for a while, where you find out that American bombers are pounding another part of Afghanistan. But if you think about George Bush and other gloomy things every day, eventually you get pessimistic enough that eventually you'll take an overdose of the sedatives your doctor gave you to control your depression. Then you'll be out of it. I mean, we'll do it every day. Want to become a concert pianist? Do it every day. Want to be a writer? Do it every day. Want to become depressed? Think of depressing thoughts every day. Want to become an optimist? Think of cheerful thoughts every day. Do it every day. I think over the course of my life, 
Either you are from a basically rational person to a basically intuitive person without completely losing my reason, I hope. And uh, intuitive people do tend to live in the future. I don't believe in golden ages, I don't believe in the past. But I think a golden age is possible in the future, and why not try for it? I have very, I have, I have very, I think, I think Bernard Shaw calls it the life force. I got this, I got this tremendous drive to try to do what I can to add my contribution to making a much better future than the history of humanity has been up until the present. And I think the joy of art is trying to convey what you perceive so that other people will perceive it more or less the same way. Art is a form of seduction. I mean, there are rapists in the intellectual world. They become politicians. The seducers become artists. We try to seduce people into our reality tunnels of leading them there with a gun. But we are trying to get them into our reality. Our reality tunnel or our reality labyrinth, or whichever it is. In my case, it's a reality labyrinth. Is a wise man, and uh, that's the way he is in person, and that's the way he is in his writings, and that's the way he is on stage. At events where Bob was a speaker, and I've just seen people come up to him and and be grateful to him for um, having awakened them. I think he has served the purpose of uh, being an alarm clock for people's psyches, and and uh, they appreciate that because. Uh, the whole culture seems to be aimed at, at lulling them to sleep. And so um, a human alarm clock is a very welcome sound and sight. When I call the universe infinite, I do not assume it is infinite in space-time, but it has infinite aspects, which means that anybody who looks at it will see something different than anybody else who looks at it. If you come back a day later and look at it again, it will still be different. William Blake said that you could see infinity in a grain of sand. And you can if you're, if you're open enough. Everything that gets into your brain affects your reality tunnel, your worldview, or your belief system, which I abbreviate BS. The, the, two, the, the, the three major things I've been trying to teach in all of my books is never believe fully in anybody else's BS. I don't care if it's Roger Nish, the Pope, L. Ron Hubbard, George Bush, or I don't care who it is. Don't, don't, don't swallow all their belief system totally. Don't, don't accept all of their bullshit, They're all their BS. The second rule is like unto the first. Don't believe totally in your own BS, which means that, as Bucky Fuller said, the universe consists of non-simultaneously apprehended events. And we're using it is, unfortunately. Universe is non-simultaneously apprehended. What? Non simultaneously. Universe is non simultaneously apprehended. What? The universe consists of non simultaneously apprehended events, which means any belief system or reality tunnel you've got right now is going to have to be revised and updated as you continue to apprehend new events non later in time, not simultaneously. You can't apprehend, you can't comprehend, you can't perceive, you can't understand the whole universe at once. That requires some thought and some repetition. The universe is non simultaneously apprehended. As we go through our lives minute by minute, second by second, day by day, we're never perceiving the same universe that we perceive. If we are, it's because we stop paying attention. That's why you get bored, you're not paying attention. We can't apprehend the whole universe right now, the past, present, and future, and all, all space, time. How it takes nine years for signals to get here from Sirius, even. Think how long it would take to get here from the other end of the, from the furthest galaxy. So, you know, in terms of general relativity, it's not the same time everywhere, so the universe is not simultaneously apprehended. So that means our knowledge at any particular time is knowledge of part of the universe. Tomorrow we'll know more, maybe not much more, maybe a lot more, who knows? I might turn on CNN tomorrow morning and find the greatest scientific discovery of the last five million years has just been announced. Now, who knows? And then again, it may take 20 years for the breakthrough of that magnitude, but 
scenario universe is non, non simultaneously apprehended, which is why we need maybe logic. Our maps of the universe, our ideas should be changing all the time. So people who claim I've got the truth just don't realize. They think they comprehend the whole universe simultaneously. It can't be done. All they comprehend it is part of it. They haven't comprehended everything up to date either because most of them don't know everything that happens up to date. I don't know everything that happens up until this date. And the people who are most sure of themselves know even less than I do in most cases, which, is, which means they're really dumb. <laughs> this is the natural functioning of the human brain. It's the way children's brains perform before they're wrecked by the school system. It's the way the minds of all great scientists and artists work. But once you have a belief system, everything that comes in either gets ignored if it doesn't fit the belief system or it gets distorted enough so that it can fit into the belief system. You've got to be continually revising your map of the world or you'll lose more and more contact with reality. Anybody who has a belief system which covers the whole universe, that would be the Roman Catholics, Orthodox Islam, the Scientologists, Psychop, the Marxists, the Objectivists, and most of the assholes you meet on the street. Uh, well, what, they, what has happened is their brain has stopped receiving new signals. Well, to the extent that new signals do get in, they all have to be edited to fit into the belief system. Now, I showed you, you can't say all about anything. You can't say all about the universe. You can't know all about this room. You can't know all about this. And if we think we know ourselves, what you really are is totally unknown. Three years ago, I couldn't get off the couch. A few months ago, I could walk three paces. I will now walk the whole length of the apartment without falling down, I hope. If I fall down, promise me you won't cut it and reshoot it. I want the audience to see the truth of what optimism can do. Hooray for the optimist. The end. You know, like that, no, this is followed by the walk.